Um, so welcome to uh, the talk. Um, we're going to be talking um, a little bit about um, how we migrated from 100 freestyle jobs into pipelines um, and uh, what we issues we hit uh, along the way. So if that's not what you're expecting to see, then do also over there. Um, so uh, I'm James Nord, and my colleague here is Baptiste Mathis. Um, so between us, we've got 20 years experience in Jenkins. Um, we both work for Cloudbees, and the clickers is not working anymore. Work. Um, so we started off, we had a set of freestyle jobs and some non-integrated pipelines. Um, yeah. um, we wanted to improve this. Um, we wanted to get more things integrated. We wanted to integrate the free cell jobs with some of the pipelines. Um, okay, thank you. You go there. Mm. I'm not sure it's gonna work. Anyway, uh, you can touch the, the computer anyway. Yeah, okay. Okay. Anyway, let's, let's go, then not, not a big issue. Uh, so we started with that, uh, which is so uh, 100 of freestyle jobs, many different pipelines here and there for, for so many reasons. Uh, we had like two jobs for each plugin, like one for typical CI, one for releasing, and some manual processes, some, some release noting process, and other teams in the, in, the, in the process also that we are not going to talk too much about today because for, for, for brevity. So, also what, what we want to talk about today, and uh, which is about the talk footing, because actually we were, as you, some people in the room may have been last year at the keynote at the Jenkins World, and so uh, CloudBees Jenkins Enterprise were, had been published, so we started also uh, migrating to it, to dog food, and uh, suffer from issues before our users and customers in general. And we also took that opportunity then to you know, refactor everything and rethink everything so that um, things would be you know, uh, done from the ground up because previously there was only one instance for the company which has grown, grown, grown so that's, uh, that's where we were coming from. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to keep our skills kind of up to date because uh, as Jenkins moves to pipeline, if we kind of stay stuck in the freestyle world, our skills are getting not as uh, up to date as they should be. So we had to then to try and build a vision for it. So we wanted to build every and all tests on each PRs. Uh, we wanted to have a quick feedback for unit tests, kind of quite, quite typical for CI in general. Uh, we wanted to have you know branch builds and so on. So we wanted to have plugin tests uh, to build our war and pass you know functional testing because we have a process for that, which is actually kind of the same one as you can find on the open source projects, which is called uh, acceptance test harness. Um, be able to create release nodes and um, the, the, the thing we have, the process we have internally to kind of, you know, streamline and have a high quality process, release process. So this is what we are, we were targeting for our pull requests. Uh, by the way, if you look on the right, you, so if you were at the keynote, you know that uh, just say that it is crap. So uh, anyway, this is what we are doing right now. Um, basically, you know, uh, executing the old tests we have on the different uh, environment or at least uh, different combinatorial, you know, find bugs testing, looking for issues and running uh, acceptance test honors uh, testing. And more importantly for me, building on Windows because yeah. being one of the sole developers on Windows, I always find all the bugs that other people put in for Windows platform, and I love it. That's great, by the way, yeah. Um, so this is kind of what we wanted after the um, pull request had gone through, so after a pull request had been merged. So our pipeline, we decided we wanted to look um, something like this. Um, so it shares quite a bit of commonality with the pull request. 
Um, so we rerun the unit tests, we rerun all the exceptions tests because some code might have changed in the interim. Um, to tag and release um, as well, so that kind of every build is going to be automatically released, um, and then assuming that it passes the stages, it would get promoted up. If it didn't, we would drop it on the floor. Um, so there's more pipelines, even more tests um, at the end of this, but that is um, handled by a different team. So we won't really talk too much about that. Um, things in here that are missing as well that we haven't put in, um, things like JIRA automation. Um, so when we build something that's got a JIRA that's tagged as fixed, we wanted to automate the JIRA to put what version it was fixed in so we could then find that out later without having to trawl back through Git logs and other stuff just to make it easier for product management and us and release notes. Um, we had kind of more visions than this as well. There was a lot of discussions on people wanting to go, ah, we could do this, we could do that, wouldn't it be great if we do that? But we had kind of a different pull. So this is the, the one that we could all sit down and go, yeah, that's, that's great, that's what we want to do. So that's what we, that's what we kind of targeted. Um, so how did we get there? Or what path did we take? Um, it wasn't simple. Um, and as you can see, off to the right, there's a little, uh, little not off the gravel track, there's a little wood track that kind of goes to a dead end. Um, we did walk down that dead end a few times, um, specifically when we tried to do too much at once. Um, so before we started on uh, the migration um, that we said to the new product and to have the new clean environment, we, we had originally tried to do this in the existing environment. And we tried to do that whole pipeline at once and go, yeah, let's do this pipeline, 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 pipeline. Um, so um, that kind of caused us to have a few fail starts. And as uh, we kind of don't get paid to write pipelines, we get paid to write features and code and fix bugs, um, that kind of got in the way as well. So um, some things that we had learned from the earlier failures, failed attempts that kind of helped us to get uh, to where we wanted to be. Um, we kind of set this up as a project in its own right. Um, we got buy-in from management from that. Um, they could see, yes, this is a good thing. We want to do this. Um, so having the management buy-in, um, having the requirements and the vision of where we wanted to go, breaking that down so we could be agile and start it. Hey, we've got a freestyle job. Let's just make that freestyle job be a pipeline and do nothing more and nothing less. Um, and even just doing, doing that first bit had a, a great, great um, impact to us because it meant once we're running pipelines as opposed to freestyle jobs, we can restart our Jenkins instance at will. And we don't kill any running jobs because the pipelines will survive a restart. Um, so once we got that, that kind of unleashed a lot of other things that we could do later on. Um, yeah, and one of the other things as well was we had the um, management buy-in, as I said, we had a ring fence developer who was actually uh, Baptiste to start with, um, who went off and siloed himself for um, a couple of weeks to kind of push through the, the first few iterations to get us going. Yeah, and so um, we wanted to actually be able to uh, to also kind of, you know, make the whole team become, you know, uh, able to work with that, uh, take responsibility. So we defined a pattern that is actually still in, in place now and it's relating. So uh, we have uh, every two weeks a developer in the team that is designed to make sure uh, failures are looked at and uh, fixed as uh, quickly as possible. And so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty useful and pretty working. So we are not planning to stop anytime soon. And, and part of that reason as well for having an allocated developer is we are fully distributed. So we, we can't have a chicken that we go and pick up and, and give to someone. And we can't pick up the rubber ball and throw it at someone and say, hey, you fixed the build, you yeah. broke it. We, we need um, a high level of um, distribution in the, kind of like, like uh, every people in the team kind of know, you know, and this is the agile thing, you know, no, no thing that are only be doable by someone in the team and no, no one else. Best factor. So what we, currently have at the moment, um, we haven't implemented the full vision. Um, so what we have at the moment is kind of on the left, um, the stuff in the gray box is stuff that we're still working on. 
Um, this is used for both pull requests and branch builds. Um, so where we originally thought we would have one for a pull request and one for a branch build, because we're not um, releasing upfront, we can have a, a certain amount of commonality. Um, so this is building all tests on a pull request um, with quick feedback for unit tests. Um, if the PR gets manually reviewed and passed, then um, it kind of originally we said, oh, we were going to auto merge, um, but we, we, we don't, we, we stop, we let humans come in and do the merge. Um, there might be extra checks that someone wants to do. Um, so we have some extra processes that are still manual as well. Um, so for a, a branch build, um, it's the same, plugin tests, uh, build the WAR that is uh, the Jenkins distribution that uh, a lot of you might be using, uh, run the tests on those WARs, and the purple arrow is on some of them we deploy that WAR to our dog food server. Um, and so that's uh, currently used on the, the new user experience that you saw demoed at the keynote, um, and not on the others, because that's where our big focus was um, in the past three months. Um, so we haven't got the creating the release notes, um, the emailing for the human poll. Um, so they're the things that we still have to do. Um, there are other pipelines that we have as well that, that help us um, know that our changes are going to work for new versions of Jenkins that are running uh, in, the back line, in the background as well. Um, so and this is kind of CD for some definition of D. It's kind of Vish delivery. We're deploying, but it's not really deployment. So, so um, now back and kind of we are trying to dig in and show you how we did that. And the main points I think uh, we are is kind of valuable for you. Uh, so we wanted, uh, for obvious reasons, to have some kind of unity and uh, have. So we decided to try and share the pipeline for every plugins we have, and it's actually um, the, the good thing because we don't need, you know, no, dupl no duplication uh, and things getting out of sync. So uh, we just decided to use a, a commercial feature that is actually in Todd Jenkins Enterprise, which is called the marker file, which actually you, uh, enables you to put some file in the repo. Can you speak slower? Yeah, sorry. I, I'm French, so I'm trying to be... <laughs> Um, so yeah, sorry. Um, so we so we use the file that we put in the repositories um, that we are that is that is going to enable the fact that then is going to be you know using a standard uh, pipeline for for everything that contains that file. So we also decided uh, and use uh, multi-branch projects, and we are not going back because really it has worked uh, very very beautifully. Um, and now, um, nowadays, adding a new plugin or a new project in our CI is going to be um, only just adding a file in a repo and we're done because it's going to be scanned automatically by Jenkins and then put in the right folder. So it's pretty, pretty neat. Um, also, we kind of developed some internal uh, feature uh, out of this using the marker file as a property file. So we are able to, you know, uh, then kind of, you know, describing the, the plugin in the plugin itself or in the project itself, we are able to, you know, use switches to, dis to decide what we are going to enable or not in our standard pipeline. So it's pretty cool. Um, we also have a nice feature. We are going to show you how we, we are doing that, uh, which enables us to switch from the default pipeline to um, a, an isolated one, which is maybe different because, uh, well, the, um, uni unity unification is great, but sometimes you need something different or to experiment or whatever. And, um, and that's mostly it, I think. We're gonna show you the next one. Yeah, so whilst this, what we have implemented uses a proprietary feature, um, you can do similar with shared libraries um, and, and just a bog standard Jenkins file, um, which instead of having a marker file, you have a Jenkins file, which has got one, one line in. Um, but there are some other advantages to using the marker file approach that we have, which is why we went down that route. Exactly. So this is how you set up, actually, uh, you set it up. So it's uh, pretty simple. You can see here. Um, it's, yeah, it's here. Yeah, maybe it's a bit better. Yeah, right. So you can see here that uh, you, can, you can specify the, the path and just a repo, a specific repo, I think it's here. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing well. 
uh, but actually using an external repo that is different from the repo of the, the project itself. So, um, and then use a, a path in that and so have a really easily um, a, a pipeline that is gonna be used for every uh, repo that is found to have that marker file. So today, updating the pipeline is just uh, updating that central one. And so, well, uh, it works very fine, but we are gonna discuss a bit later the fact that it's gonna produce some other issues. Um, and so, yeah. Um, so what our pipeline actually looks like, or what we started off with, the kind of initial version, um, so rather than using the scripted Jenkins file approach, we used declarative. Um, so that was in, in alpha or beta when we started. So we were, again, we were trying to dog food um, the new features coming out so we could fix them before they were unleashed on, on you guys to make sure that they were solid and robust. And we started off with um, something a little bit like that. So we had the pipeline. Um, we had uh, who we wanted to send an email to on failure. Um, that's for when we had some branches with features on, we only wanted to spam the two people or three people that were working on that feature rather than the whole team. Um, and one thing uh, that we had to have is we ended up kind of realizing that we needed to skip stages. Um, so we were running the unit tests, the unit tests were failing, they were marking the build as unstable, and then it would run on to the next stage and run the acceptance tests. Now, when we know we've got unit test failures, we're pretty sure the acceptance tests are gonna fail. If they're not, then the unit test is gonna be broken. Um, and when the acceptance tests fail, a failure is generally gonna be a timeout or a hard fail, and it's gonna take a, a long time for it to fail rather than failing uh, quickly in the normal time it would take to run. So without the skip stages, um, we would run this separate, the, extra bits and at the same time because we want to do continuous deployment at the end of it if you've got unit test failures or acceptance test failures you certainly don't want to deploy um, so that's a very useful thing um, so um, the emails as well on the post which is quite standard and probably the first thing you do so the posts um, you have the uh, success fail and can't quite read from there, um, but you can read it. They work kind of as a thing, so your pipeline fails, it will send an email. Your pipeline um, changes, it will send an email. Um, but when you're doing pull requests, we've got GitHub. Um, so, yeah, we don't want to to actually, as James was saying, uh, spam the whole team for PRs because actually the right place we want to look at for failed or successful PRs is actually GitHub itself, and we want to send email for that. So um, the good thing is that actually we can, mm, we were finding so a way to do that. So um, we didn't want to spam. So basically how we do that is just using the change ID. Uh, and so we are able to use the script as I think it was presented yesterday during even the keynote with Kosuke. Um, the fact that you can, when declarative as not out of the box, the, 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 the feature you're looking for, you can then use a script block to add the logic you're missing. The good thing uh, is actually we discovered that yesterday, talking with Andrew Bayer, the main developer of Declarative, is actually that this is extensible, so we are probably going to add some, uh, very soonish, uh, some new post um, things, like fixed, for instance, to go for from um, unstable to yeah, or broken to exactly. success because we don't care about change if you think about it uh, I mean there is already post slash failure or post slash changed we care about failure every time we want to send an email for a failure but when it's uh, changed we don't want to care about from success to failure because this is going to already trigger an email. So we would get two emails. So we want to care about only kind of back to success. So it's not changed, it's gonna be fixed. So I think we're gonna introduce, for instance, a fixed one and try to also make it more declarative, made more, you know, DSL-ish um, for the also the PR related things instead of having to use, you know, if something, which is not very, very, so, uh, we want yeah. to avoid programming. So the, the PR, to check the PR is you can check the um, change ID in the environment. 
And the way to see if a build is a success, or actually in this case, that it hasn't got any result. If the build hasn't got a result, it's currently a success. <laughs> so it's a bit counterintuitive, but if you get the, the current build result and it's null, then you know you're a success. So that's how we go, aha, it's back to success. And as you can see, so we put uh, on purpose for people who want to contribute or have a look and, or dig into those. We actually filed uh, along the way where we were duffooding a whole lot of different issues and those are the ones we filed and started discussing and, and sometimes uh, even filing the right uh, pull request associated to it. So if you want to look at it, uh, you, can, you have the reference on the slide. If you're checking for null on every one of these for the change ID, why not just check for current build result? What's the difference between the, you don't understand. You're always checking for null on every one of them. Yeah, because we don't. Um, so I, I'm going to kill the camera. The cameraman's going to get annoyed at me now, so I'll just jump up because I can't see the screen otherwise. Um, so if, if we put that further up, you mean, so if we put the if, yeah. if change. The problem is with declarative, um, those can only live within a block. So you've got the post, and then you've got the what kind of uh, result for the post. And then within that, you've got the action. So you can't put the action further up. What we, what we were talking about is we could actually change that from, because the failure um, and the unstable and changed, we could implement a new one. We could implement uh, failed on PR or failed on not on PR and then replace all of that block and just have a mail bit. So that's the extension point, which is 20, uh, 42 something, something, something. Yeah, and what, what we were discussing still yesterday and, and since a few weeks, a few months even, is for instance, then, well, not on PR, that kind of block would be where we would use it. It could be useful in post, um, but it could be also useful in a step somewhere else. So it needs more thinking to make it right and, you know, because this is the, the, the rational and the, the gist of, of uh, declarative, making things more, you know, um, clear out of the box, even for somebody that would come to it for the first time and would understand what is probably going to be, done, to be doing. So, um, what we had on the pull request is, like I said, we're, we're building um, the uh, unit test. We're then also building the, um, the user acceptance tests, and we're building kind of uh, three different ones of these. So, we can have a long flow, so it's nowhere near the five minutes turnaround that everyone wants on, on a commit being, being validated. Um, but we still want the quick feedback. Um, so one way that we are working around that is um, you have the GitHub notify step, um, and you can put this within your pipeline, and then when you're on a pull request, um, it will put a status in GitHub that corresponds to whatever you're telling it to do on the current PR that's being tested. So kind of we can see in the pull request, we can see that it's past unit tests, and it's now in the acceptance test uh, phase, or that it failed on... Um, it failed on flying bugs. And the neat thing here is these details, you can customize all the link. So if we had one there, we don't have it in here, but if we had one for flying bugs, you could click on that and you would be taken straight to the flying bug results page in Jenkins, as opposed to being taken to the Jenkins page for the build and then having to work out, is it flying bugs, is it unit tests, and going directly to the one. Yeah, um, one of the other pitfalls we had, we've got this common pipeline. Um, we're building uh, the pull requests, we're building the WARs so we can test them. Uh, each WAR is kind of about 300 meg. We're building five of them in each build. Um, and we were kind of like, yep, yeah, we want to keep history. Um, we had that common pipeline, so we want to keep the history on the master. Um, and what we found out was um, ops kept going oops, as our Jenkins crashed, and we go, uh, can we have some more disk space, please? Can we have some more disk space? And kind of when we ran to about a terabyte of disk usage, we kind of thought, oh, maybe this is a bit too much. Okay. Um, so we kind of forgot, um, you know, when, when we're building pull requests, and probably for, for yourself, you don't really care too much about the history. You don't really care too much about the artifacts. You don't really care too much about having much history, because once a pull request is merged, it's like ah, you, you've got GitHub or you've got Garrett, which records the state. Um, 
So how we ended up having to work around that, um, we have a, um, a bit here again that uh, is similar to what you saw before with the if n changed ID is not equal to null, we're on a pull request and we know that. So we set a default further up before we start the pipeline of um, keeping 100 builds, um, but only five builds with artifacts. And then if we detect we're on a pull request, we change those. And they're just at this point, just standard groovy variables. And then inside declarative, we come in and then we configure the log rotator with the number that we actually configure further up. And the reason for doing that is we can't actually put a script block inside the options for there. So this was the way that we found that worked for us. And so, <clears throat> um, as, we, as I said a bit earlier, uh, we wanted to you know, go further just the marker file features and, and thing. And uh, so we started using pretty early in the project actually um, uh, some, some special code to be able to actually load that marker file as a property file and then be able to switch on the value that were contained in that one to be able to very easily customize the behavior uh, by, by actually storing that metadata in the, the, the thing that is being described itself and not outside. So as you can see, it's pretty, um, it's a bit convoluted, but it's, it's still quite clear. We are just you know, overriding the value of the environment variable you see at the top, because this is our, for, for, those, for those who, don't, who didn't have a look at declarative yet, there are you know, neat things and, and you know, um, clear things like declarative, the, the declaring the variables you are going to use and so on and so forth. So we need to, or we declare them with some value and then override them um, in a bit of a convoluted way, but it still works and it's very cool because now, for instance, we had the case recently with a team uh, that uh, were taking over some uh, of our plugins to, to manage them. And so we said, well, uh, either we, we, tell, we tell that team, uh, well, um, go away, um, <laughs> do what you want, but you're, we are not um, going to share the, our, our master instance or we, we decide to just say, okay, let's just work together. It's, everything is in place for us. We are just going to override, and because actually we introduced that feature more recently than the others, and say, okay, we are just going to customize the email that, um, where, where the emails are going to go out for notifications, and that's it. So that team is using kind of our infrastructure we put in place for everything, but the emails are going elsewhere. And so it's very easy to do. And so uh, we want to make it even simpler, so all that yada yada of code, uh, is actually an internal tracker, and we already discussed quite a lot about making that out of the box working. For marker file, would be like a checkbox in the UI of Jenkins would be already available as environment variable, so you would be you know, able to use that very like out of the box without any twiddling, like we do here. We will talk about it a bit in a minute. It's a bit maybe convoluted, but we will re-explain after. Uh, so as we said a bit earlier, or so or so. It's great the, to be able to unify um, dozens of different projects, but sometimes you need something different. For instance, as you saw the presentation yesterday, we wanted for kind of obvious reasons, some be able to experiment, to do some different things, to deploy to internal dog fooding server for the new user experience for uh, teams and in the Cloud Vision Kids Enterprise. So you always need something. So it's pretty uh, actually simple. We uh, did that um, thing, which is in, our, in the top of our pipeline. Basically, if we find in that repo a Jetkins file, we, we, pass, we, we pass the button to it. And if not, then the default one is going to be used. You see the evaluate of the Jenkins file that got found. So it's pretty easy to do, actually. And you want to remember that line for later. Exactly. So we have this common pipeline, which is great. It's now being rolled out across um, more and more of the plugins that we use. In fact, it, it's um, the majority of the ones that we have. Um, so 50, which is great, but then when you have a breakage in your pipeline, um, actually in the pipeline rather than the, the pipeline job, so your, your declarative pipeline, then you're gonna break absolutely everything. Um, so you then need to, once you start doing this, test the pipeline. Um, after all, it's code. Um, and one of the advantages we've got from having the pipeline uh, or the Jenkins file stored 
in, in a different repo from the code is that we've got this, this one pipeline and it makes it slightly easier to do some extra or slightly different testing strategies on it. So as we were going through, um, we used various different testing strategies. So testing strategy number one, which is kind of, we started off with this, um, you just commit a change. Do it in production. If it breaks, it breaks. Um, and then you just kind of have to fix it whilst it's broken and eventually you will end up with a working pipeline. Um, it kind of works okay if you're a small team and your pipeline is really quick. Um, it requires zero initial investment. You can get started with this today. Um, but it obviously doesn't scale. Um, and if you're not a one-person team, it is going to annoy your teammates to the point that they'll start throwing things at you. Um, so you best hope you're not in the same office. And so the, the other thing uh, with regard to testing strategies we, we wanted to do or we could do um, is using actually the standard feature you may know about, which is um, let you uh, lint or at least validate the declarative pipeline you have written and it's even usable on your own machine. And so basically you ask declarative to tell you if, is it valid or is it not? Uh, so uh, the thing is, we didn't like the first uh, version on the top because actually it's kind of weird if you think about it. We would have had to you know, call uh, Jenkins from Jenkins itself. It's kind of very convoluted and a bit ugly. So we actually discussed with the development team and filed the required issue and it got developed. And so we ended up having the second one far later and so this is what we are using and we are going to show you afterwards. Um, so the validate um, really is checking your syntax of the declarative pipeline. If you've got groovy code, you've got script blocks, it is not going to tell you that that is garbage. It will tell you that your structure of your pipeline is okay. But the thing is, as James was saying, we were breaking things in production kind of. Uh, you would be surprised, well, I, I'm not sure if you're surprised actually, but the number of actually stupid mistakes we did, like or forgetting a comma or whatever, that actually now are actually fetched, um, uh, catched by that. So um, the, uh, one of the other strategies that we kind of use, rather than just kind of editing the code for the pipeline and committing it, is on one of the plugins that we had, we would use the replay feature in Jenkins pipeline which if you're not aware of it, if you've got a build um, that's gone through on a pipeline, there is a replay feature um, within pipeline that will then load up all of the code for all of any shared libraries, uh, the Jenkins file that that build used. And you can go and edit it and then run it. And it will use the same checkout, but it will use the new, um, the, the new pipeline code that you put in. Um, so that kind of has uh, an advantage in that you kind of keep linear history. You can still test things in production, but it's isolated to just breaking one plugin. Um, and if it then works, you can go copy and paste that into your Jenkins file. Um, you know, it tests the entire pipeline. You can add stuff quite quickly. Again, it's not a lot of um, initial investment, um, but it would be better to do that on a test job that mimics something um, as opposed to a real job just to keep a nice smooth history because otherwise you're going to have potentially some failed builds in your history that don't look so good. And so <clears throat> uh, there's another strategy. By the way, today you, there's a talk dedicated to it um, using a pipeline unit. Uh, so basically this is a framework, let's, let's say, or an API more framework, um, letting you test locally um, and kind of mocking things and, and many nice things like that to let, uh, to make you, to let you uh, test more easily the thing you are writing in a pipeline without needing, you know, to having a full-blown Jenkins run somewhere uh, to test what you are um, touching, looking at or touching. Uh, the nice, uh, the, the nice uh, advantage of that, it's kind of, you can probably use the, you know, the, 
the tooling like uh, knowing what you are actually testing, the better coverage and so on, but uh, it's not necessarily using the exact model instead of our isolation, so you know, ignoring the sandbox, uh, possibly, so, and the learning curve because it's a new framework. But uh, overall, uh, I've, I've used it in the past. We are not using it yet uh, in our main pipeline, but it's overall very simple to, to use and to play with, so I encourage you to have a look and actually go to the, the session uh, later today. Um, so, kind of number five um, is or just kind of having a canary job. I touched about a, having a test job and then using replay. You could have a test job and a PR builder for that um, or for the pipeline, um, which tests the actual pipeline with some actual code. Um, it uses a sandbox. I want to say you've got a PR builder because we're using a Jenkins file from a different repository. We specify the path to that Jenkins file. That doesn't need to be in the root. Um, so in the same repository, we can have a different Jenkins file. Um, which, which kind of then loads up some, some slightly different behavior. Um, it does use the sandbox, um, so it's going to kind of run exactly the same as your pipeline would. Um, but it's only going to exercise the paths that would be exercised by whatever you're building. So if whatever you're building is okay, it's only going to exercise the happy paths. Um, so if you want to exercise all of your paths, you're going to end up to have quite a few canary products, oh, and it takes longer. And so, um, also something that actually we are uh, telling users in general quite often on the users mailing list, by the way, uh, don't try to use pipeline in general as a programming language. You want to use it as an orchestration language or, or tooling. So if you have, if you are going, you are beginning to use, you know, involved groovy structure like you are programming, and it's pretty nice, but it's not. For many reasons, you want, do want to do that. So if really you need some more evolved things, for many reasons, you need to externalize it either in a shared script or in Groovy script, for instance, but the, the pure one, external file, that le then would be um, let, let, letting you quite easily test that thing outside of your pipeline. You know, pipeline should be used for orchestration, not for you know, doing everything, computing everything as a programming language. So are you saying that the, this Groovy code should be in a separate repository? Or just in the source directory? No, just another file possibly, but something that we could run very easily locally, like you know, just using Groovy that file because you want to say extract something from a file or any anything related to loosely to programming for, for your build process. So Jesse, I think, had a talk on this yesterday, who's in the audience um, just behind you, um, called Use Jenkins Less. How to use Jenkins Less, <laughs> Jesse? Yeah. yeah, which the slide should be up. Um, sometime later this week or um, when, whenever they're up. Um, so that'll give you some more information about that. Um, so we're using um, a combination of strategies, so three and five. Um, and this is the Jenkins file that allows us to test uh, other Jenkins files. So um, we're looking to integrate the pipeline unit test into this as well. Um, but the thing I asked you to remember earlier um, which is, do, 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 I can't find where it is, where it is, yeah, there we go, the pipeline. <laughs> um, so that is kind of quite important because we look for the existence of a Jenkins file in our Jenkins file and then evaluate that Jenkins file. If we just loaded up the Jenkins file and then kind of changed it and ran that Jenkins file, it would then look for a Jenkins file which would find this Jenkins file which would, and so on and so forth. So we don't want infinite recursion in our tests um, and we don't want to kill Jenkins with the infinite recursion. Um, so all we do is we read the Jenkins file into a string and then chop off everything before that, or before that magic marker. Um, before, because we're chopping off that magic marker, we need to reset some of the defaults. So we need to reset the uh, properties that we're expecting. So we've got the, the uh, email down there and other things. And, um, we're changing then um, the, instead of doing checkout SCM, we're checking out our Canary product uh, project, um, and we call the validate pipeline uh, further up there. So, um, probably there, I can't quite yeah. see. Um, so it's a combination of them, it's automatic. We do a pull request to, to the repository containing the Jenkins file. Jenkins goes and checks it using uh, a Canary job and the linter. So we have much, much less failures because of this. Um, and if we're writing a whole new stage, um, we probably start prototyping that in the replay 
or using a separate Jenkins file on a separate job just for, for testing. So overall, um, with all that, we encountered quite a lot of uh, issues or gotchas, so we are going to try and uh, tell you the things we think are, are um, interesting to talk about so that you, you, you don't uh, at least encounter the same issues as, as we did. So basically, um, the, right now, so this is kind of related to what I said earlier, saying, okay, we want to make that simpler. But basically, uh, loading a marker file as a property file is kind of, uh, because declarative uses environment variables, we need some bit of twiddling to be able to, you know, override the value, then load it from something else, and that's it. So it's not uh, as easy as we would like it to be. And for obvious reasons, it's not very, you know, declarative style. So we really want to get it, to, to make it more, more uh, to make it nicer. But well, that's, that's one of the gotchas. Um, so the other gotcha that we have, um, I mentioned this last year, if you saw my talk last year, um, when you've got one big bucket of tests that takes uh, X hours, you can use a functionality called split tests, which will kind of write an exclusions file that's understood by Maven and some other tooling. Um, so it looks at the test results, um, splits those into however many buckets based on the amount of time it took to run those tests, so if you had eight buckets, it would try and split them into eight equal size buckets. So you can run those in parallel on eight different machines. It will take an eighth of the time plus a little bit of overhead. Um, when you do that in a pipeline, um, because we're not just running one acceptance test harness, we're running three plus unit tests, it looks at the tests that run for the previous build. And those tests are all of the tests for all of the acceptance tests, harnesses, and all of the unit tests. So when it comes to splitting them, it goes, these are equal size buckets, but those tests don't exist in the test framework that we're excluding them from. So we end up with kind of pretty much uh, two big buckets and a lot of small buckets that don't do anything. Instead uh, of saving time. So we still have the same workaround as we did before, which is um, put those tests into separate jobs and call them from pipeline. Um, there is currently now a pull request in progress um, that is to try and make this actually work better. Um, so that should hopefully be coming soon. So um, the agent definition is something we want to be, to, to be aware about. In, in declarative, if you put at the top agent uh, any, and in some sub, uh, sub um, stage, you put agent none, basically it's going to do nothing instead of what you may expect, that it would override and for that given stage not need any agent, or, but it's not going to do anything actually. So we were, so basically right now the, the status is that declarative is gonna use probably more executors than you would like to be if you were able to really fine tune it like you would be able to do it with scripted, but overall it's so much simpler to you that, well, it's for now, let's say, uh, uh, something that will probably be improved over time, uh, I hope. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can have stages, um, not so much for in declarative pipeline, but if you're still using the scripted pipeline, you can have stages within stages. Um, it doesn't visualize anywhere, so just don't do it, because it won't look like what you're expecting it to do, and it will probably confuse you. And so overall, uh, kind of uh, trying to, to, to conclude, uh, we encountered quite some issues and we fixed some along the way. So um, the issue being we hope to be able to, you know, uh, hit the issues before you people uh, encourage on them. So for instance, we suffered a lot. Uh, some, uh, I'm sure some people in the room already suffered from that some month ago now from the rate limit issue with GitHub, because actually CloudBiz has um, 1,500 repositories in the organization. So when each time we try, we have you know, a multi-branch project trying to scan the organization, basically we hit that issue every time. So we kind of you know, dog food that thing overall, and it's really pushed forward um, our development teams to make sure that was fixed so that we could just work ourselves. Yeah, and there's been fixes in declarative as well that we haven't, uh, th that we would have talked about, but they're fixed now, so it's mm -hmm. kind of, they're no longer in the slides. Um, so, um, kind of to, in summary, just to summarize up, um, when you're gonna move from a freestyle job to a pipeline, just start with 
just the bare minimum, which is take your build step from the freestyle, put it in a pipeline. Don't try and do too much at two once. Do that and then organically grow it out and replace more and more. Um, kind of do it in an agile way. Um, there is benefit in just replacing your freestyle uh, with, a, with a pipeline that you can restart your Jenkins that makes upgrades and security fixes so much easier and less headache if any of you happen to also be Jenkins admins. Um, have a vision, have a, have a vision for the team. Um, there's nothing worse than having different people having different ideas for what, what's going to happen. So treat it like you would a software project. Um, and as your pipeline is growing, just test it, test it, and then test it some more. And those time to say thank you. And do you have any questions with uh, all this? Yep. So I have a question to the firm. So the way you did this, you had uh, a multi-branch job with the market value, dot dot plugging, whatever. And that was a property style. And that is essentially input to kind of like common declarative pipeline script. Um, so the question was, we had, uh, did we just have a um, multi-branch project um, pointing at a repository where that repository just contained a marker file, which was a properties file, which was used as an input into the declarative pipeline that we declared elsewhere. 99% um, correct, we'd used GitHub organizations as opposed to a standalone uh, multi-branch project, but in, in essence, yes. So the declarative pipeline like a shared library, how is that process? Kind of. We are actually not using shared libraries, but it's, it's, it can be seen like, like this, yeah. So the question was, is so the, this kind of equivalent to using a shared library? So the answer is kind of yes, because indeed we are using that feature to have some central place where we have a pipeline that is going to be used across our, all our plugins. So, yeah. Okay, so... So the question is, uh, what is the, the actual implementation was not that clear. So basically, we have an, an now another repository containing the source of the pipeline right. that is going to be used for right. dozens of right. other repositories. So normally here, this, this is the kind of, if you set up a GitHub organization, um, you have the drop down for looking for the, basically it says, look for a Jenkins file, and what is the name of a Jenkins file? Um, this kind of replaces that, um, or, or you, it's an option. You can have this or, or, or the other one. So the open source has just looking for a Jenkins file, or uh, you, but you give it the path. Whereas we, uh, in the commercial implementation, you have the path. That's, where that's your entry point. Um, so, so that's that's the declarative pipeline that we're loading up if we find this marker file. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. You have multiple declarative files in that repository for the different types of projects? Yes. So if somebody for one project makes a change, that will trigger the PR for all of them, right? Yep. Okay. Oh, why do you have the rotating developer? Why not each developer fix their own problem? Um, well, someone has to find out. Oh, sorry, yep, I'll repeat the question. So why do we have a rotating developer? Why doesn't each developer fix their own problem? Um, someone has to first say that it, this developer caused the problem. Um, so um, because of the, the testing frameworks and the way we're running the acceptance test harness, someone could have committed some code change to the acceptance test harness that yeah. breaks the plugin build. And sometimes it's so, not that clear. Yeah, so someone has to do some triaging. It's yes. not always, sometimes there's flaky tests that someone committed like three months ago that just happens to now start flaking. Um, and the other reason is um, that there's other pipelines as well um, that we've got that, that we're looking at. So people are looking at those pipelines as well. And we want to kind of allow a developer to focus on their work, um, so not have to context switch back and forth as well to go, oh, this pipeline over here, which we run on a schedule to whenever there's a, a, a nightly build from Jenkins, we test our products against that. So someone goes and looks at kind of the failures there. And that's, no one's changed that apart from some open source developer. So in, in we, can't, we can't make them do it. And in addition to that, I think there's two things. Actually, the triad, the the, 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 peer, the person that is going to triage that, indeed, is probably going to ping the, the, the people introducing the issue. But it's also, you know, trying to 
to disperse or to you know spread the knowledge about the CI system so that there's not only the people breaking it and you know um, so it's kind of uh, also a teamwork you know uh, uh, so multiple yeah uh, another, another responsibility of the of what we termed the build master is to actually improve the pipeline as well so they they would be generally responsible for on their two weeks if if someone or if we were going to add an extra stage or tweak it to do something else. Um, so, for example, putting in those GitHub notify stages, which I did on, on uh, Friday, um, it's then to someone's allocated to do that. So we are running out of time, so um, I propose that if you have any questions, just reach out to us after, and that's, uh, we will be we, uh, very happy to answer yeah, We'll questions. be kicking around the community booth. Also, yeah, so yeah. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you very much, everybody.